a warped sense of possession. I knew how in evening it cooled off, some rest on the forehead, some grace in quietness, some darkness coming over its shoulder. I've seen the river's plain table and its gifts from the dead daughter, shells, birds, the white tail that makes its way through blonde grasses to drink at the shore. The mountains, too large to be called home. You run from them for shelter in a town. You dominate your life, your house with kitsch. As for the river, it's more modest. It stays and it leaves. Who can compare it to generations made from a forked design, the Madison Jefferson Gallatin, its bed brown as a trout or bullhead, its water green and blue, jump two feet and you've made it from bank to shore. Pebbles and dirt underfoot, juniper musk carried on a hill, chill May wind. Here and there, coves along the river, the charred remains of an evening fire. Impossible not to want to light one if the creature you are is human. If it's night and there's driftwood at hand and you're with friends or alone and you're listening to the river pocked with age, still flowing indelibly by. I just want to say that I maintain my connections with Moorbridge. My sister and her family live there and I go back often and I see classmates and go to the church I used to go to. Did Christine, did you want us to say something about what we noticed uh, differences at this time or are we going around? Yeah, we'll go around again. Good, okay. thank you all <laughs> for listening. Bruce, why don't you go next? Uh, you mean me, uh, Christine? Okay. Um, well, I live not that far away from Mulberry myself. I live uh, about 50, 40, 50 miles uh, central South Dakota on the uh, east side of uh, the Missouri River. Um, fourth generation um, on, on the land. I went away to get uh, educated and for whatever reason, I felt just a really big pull and I came back. Uh, the only son of a farmer rancher. He died uh, within a few years after I came back. Uh, the reason why I'm telling you this is uh, uh, that was back in the 1980s, which was kind of tough times and farm time, but I was determined to make it. This poem I'm gonna read is kind of the product of that because the lines came to me over that period of uh, the 80s, early 90s, and then I wrote it down in early 2000s. Uh, very prayer here on this arc of grass, sun, and sky. I will stay and see if I thrive. Others leave, they say it's too hard. I say, hammer my spirit thin, spread it horizon to horizon, see if I break. Let the blizzards hit my face, let my skin feel the winter's freeze. Let the heat of summer's extreme try to sear the flesh from my bones. Do I have what it takes to survive or will I shatter and break? Hammer me thin, stretch me from horizon to horizon. I need to know the character that lies within. I want to touch a little further beyond my reach for the something that I seek only then. Let my spirit be released. Thank you. <laughs> Marla, do you mind going next? No, thank you. Yeah, and thank you uh, everyone for being here. I just wanna say too that um, Bruce is the president of the South Dakota State Poetry Society. 
And I'm on the board of directors. And one of the things we get to do is to uh, recruit and take nominations and then make a recommendation to the governor for poet laureate for the next four years. And um, I've been fortunate to know Christine and be her colleague and friend and to learn from her for over a decade and a half now. <laughs> so um, when she said that she wanted to do this anthology, if we would appoint her as, or recommend to the governor to appoint her as poet laureate, we all knew that what, if Christine says she's gonna do it, she gets it done. So bravo, it's, it's just been a wonderful project and um, I'm happy to be here and happy to be with all the other poets. So thank you for being here. So my poem in the book is called Outsourcing. Uh, based on a true conversation I had with a man in India. Outsourcing. I call an 800 number to register my quicken and reach a man named Gary. I am in another country, he says. All of us are far apart, I think, but do not say it. I am in India. Have you ever been? I wonder if he's seen those tigers prowl in salt water marshes. And he asks about our snowstorm. I say the coast had snow, but here in the middle, we giggle it made national news. We always have snow. I have never seen snow in my life, Gary confesses, both sin and desire. Tell me what snow is like. I tell him that this winter's snow is beautiful. It falls like down. When the wind is still, the snow rests on bare branches that weave the sky together. Sometimes it falls in wet flakes and freezes white. Sometimes it falls as rain and freezes clear. From my roof, an icicle hangs thick as my thigh, it glistens like a cold fish. I want to break it off and keep it, but I'm afraid it will slip through my fingers and shatter. Last night, I dreamt I walked into a tiny room, barely a foyer, a transitional place, and the floor was covered with shattered glass. The man I was with ripped his hand from mine and turned away as if it were my fault. It's quiet here, I say. It's quiet on the line. I hear Gary, Gary breathing in the hush. I almost fall in love. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we'll have John Nelson. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Um, I am a longtime South Dakotan. I was born in Sioux Falls and lived most of my life in South Dakota. Spent some time other places, but uh, um, I returned when I got the chance. Um, and it, even when I lived in other places, I often found myself writing about um, South Dakota, uh, especially my youth here. Um, it, it might be interesting to some of you to note that um, my earliest time in South Dakota was on a farm that was within sight of the first nuclear reactor in the United States, uh, just east of Sioux Falls, the Pathfinder nuclear power plant. We could see it from our house. I was just a little guy. Anyway, um, the poem, I'm so happy to be in this anthology and think it really represents South Dakota well. And I'm happy to have my poem in there. And I'm going to read this one um, called Monuments. Um, I think, lived for a while up just off of Lake Travers, one of the border lakes in South Dakota, way up in the northeast corner. I could see Minnesota from my house across the lake. Um, 
and I had a friend there that whose family had been there forever and he told me he was a carpenter and he told me the story of uh, being on the farm when uh, these carpenters came out and built the barn for their farm and uh, they didn't have electricity it was before the REA came there and that's sort of where this poem monuments uh, got its germ monuments these gray houses we see along roadsides across the Dakotas, leaning into the cold wind, must stake their claim to imagination's memory like old men telling stories against forgetting. Once this old house was a load of lumber from town, straining horses' shanks, horses with names, horses further gone than the old men who built it men who clean their tools each evening after work. I see them now easing down hallways in wheelchairs. But 50, 60 years ago, these suntanned boys swaggered and wagered who could lay more shingles, carry more two by fours, walk the wall and defy gravity. Now old, the fellows walk a narrow path and strain to see the rooftops they once slid down into hay piles, spooking the horses they'd follow back to town to re return again at sunrise, seeing their accomplishment for miles. Old houses, their fate a rocky grave or a funeral pyre, they and the old men may lean and gray, fade and crumble. I hope the old men reach in their memories for bottles of beer still as cold in streams as ever, their sweaty arms gilded in sawdust. Thank you. I look forward to our discussion. Laura Jean, you're up next. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Jean Binkley. I am um, particularly Delighted to be a part of this because um, I grew up in Brookings, South Dakota. So thanks so much to the Brookings Art Council. Thanks, Ashley. Um, but I currently reside in Wilder, Vermont. So um, I, I definitely have strong ties. And I have found after leaving South Dakota, the ties only become stronger because so many people say, um, you're from South Dakota? I've never met anyone from South Dakota. So it's been kind of my uniqueness that I've brought out into the world and um, is a sort of something I always come back to. Um, so with that, I'll read my, my poem because that has a, a little bit of both elements. Um, me growing up in South Dakota, coming out to um, Vermont and how I, I most keenly identify as, as a white woman from South Dakota. White woman, South Dakota with the epigraph. At the center of the universe dwells the great spirit. And that center is really everywhere. It is within each of us, black elk. I grew up in Indian Hills next to an unmarked pioneer graveyard where the Northview Lads and Lassies 4-H club planted flowers under a metal cross painted white. It was flag day, 1992, my mom, serve strawberry shortcake with berries from Sanderson Gardens. Everyone in Brookings knows about Sanderson strawberries. Josie's dad owns the farm and he paid us $6 per flat to pick the fields in early morning, staining our fingertips red before volleyball camp, before swimming at the Hillcrest pool. Six is $30 when you're 10, but I was probably older. In the field of my memory, we're all hunched over, searching for the big, ripe, juicy ones the ones we hold up to show off or keep greedily to ourselves, eating until our bellies ache. I pat my baby's belly as he falls asleep in his crib in Vermont. My hand looks old in the low light, so close to the beginning of someone else's journey. I left home over 19 years ago. People ask where I'm from, then they tell me I'm the only one they know who's lived in South Dakota. I don't feel special. The state never felt like it was mine to claim, yet I was given a childhood of summers camping in the Black Hills. My great-grandparents from England planted themselves in Pierre. 
lonely and exposed, I always knew I wanted to leave, go east, see the ocean. But I belong to the weathered rock in Sylvan Lake. A trail at the water's edge leads hikers to the highest point east of the Rockies, Black Elk Peak. No mountain matches it, and it doesn't matter. I carry the view inside me. Thank you. Tom, you're up next. Thank you. My name's Tom Simmons. Uh, it looks like I'm in, standing outside the walls of Timbuktu, but I'm in Vermilion, South Dakota, which is also where I was born. But I've also spent uh, a good chunk of my life out West River. And in West River, South Dakota, of course, we have the Ellsworth Air Force Base. And we had kind of a complicated relationship with the bomb as I was growing up. A lot of my friends' dads worked with the missiles and so forth. So this poem is kind of about that. It's called Unrot. And I'm going to do a little bit of an edited version of it because it's a little bit long. Having harnessed the power of the atom at Trinity, they set about unharnessing it that it might take wing. Not long after, not far from Hermosa, we buried quite a surprise. After months of stiff backs, blisters, long hours, we completed the task, stretched and admired it. With the toes of our work boots, we dusted its clamshell covers with West River soil and a few cockleburrs for good measure, and then waited for just the right moment. Not even Oppenheimer could truly conceive its overpowering might, blasting human beings, melting them in a flash. There, while it stood ready, still and erect just beneath the ground, its crown barely fitting within its rooftops, ready with a turn of a key or two to do its dance. This crescent misplacing its disc, this deathness forgetting itself, a sunset stripped of a dusk, a self-madeness which possesses its own becoming to thereby unmake us which stands where we buried it and thereafter attended to it. Where we lived with it, we made peace with that thing. Thank you. Thank you. And Steve Wingate, you can wrap up the reading portion for us. Now this is kind of a long poem, uh, but Christine said I should read it all. So uh, I'm going to read it all. It's, uh, it's not a line poem. I don't write a lot of line poems. I tend to write prose poems because I'm primarily a fiction person, but uh, getting into prose poetry uh, is a way for me to really kind of stay in touch with the language without having to think too much about uh, how things fit together into some kind of big narrative plan. This is called Octet for My Future South Dakota Cells. When I finally move to Wall, I'll stop dressing like I'm from somewhere else and become the guy who hangs out by the jackalopes at Wall Drug, chatting up tourists. And management will think about kicking me out, but decide against it because I'm too good for business. And eventually they'll pay me to hang out and dust the jackalopes. And won't it be fun watching me turn from outsider to local good luck charm? When I finally move to Wall Bay, I'll make my own canoe by hand and drift out on the lake each morning to greet the sunrise with complicated prayers in a language I discovered beneath a pile of rotting trees. And I'll use those prayers to conjure up a religion nobody else will know about until somebody kicks the rocks I hid it under, at which point it will coalesce into a mist and speak the secret name before drifting off until someone else conjures it again. When I finally move to Aberdeen, I'll invent some kind of windproof fabric to take away the memory of the coldest day I've ever experienced, which was in May on a soccer field in this very town that I came to unprepared and I drank so much hot cocoa from the concession stand that I couldn't smell the stuff for a year without my ligaments clacking in fear of cold wind. When I finally move to winter, I'll feel like a winner and buy myself a yurt and not bother trying to blend in this time and be the freak I am at heart and dispense with shame entirely because my yurt will be highly transportable. And once everybody gets sick of the crazy clothes I wear to keep myself halfway sane, I'll run off into the night, leaving nothing behind but a mountain of stuffed animals soaked in kerosene waiting for their perfect match. 
When I finally move to Presho, I'll ditch the yurt and resume my desperate attempts to blend in as I study on the sly to become a shaman in several Siberian traditions simultaneously. And my cover story will be that I lost my house and family in Nebraska from sniffing too much glue. And I'll become the guy at the gas station cash register who philosophizes all the customers, which is bad for business and counterbalances the good luck I brought to the jackalopes in wall several selves prior. When I finally move to Chamberlain, I'll dig a big wood-fired kiln into a hillside overlooking the Missouri River and spend my time stoking its flames and firing clay mask after clay mask. And if I don't like how they look when the kiln cools, I'll chuck them into the river like frisbees and anthropologists from the future will wonder what kind of civilization created so many cells and just drop them into the water like that. When I finally move to Deadwood, I'll take up gambling in casinos. I mean, why the heck not after gambling so long with my life? And when I win a ton of money at slots, I'll buy expensive versions of the most South Dakota clothes I can find so nobody can ever tell me that I dress like I'm not from around here again. When I finally move to Hot Springs, I'll buy a membership at Evans Plunge and go back to my shamanic studies. And the mist of the religion I conjured in War Bay will wrap around my shoulders like a cloak and declare its kinship with all others of its kind. And I'll look so at home floating in the warmest corner of the pool that you won't even notice me because I'll be part of the state finally, part of the world and wandering is the last thing I'll feel like doing. Thank you, everyone. Those are great readings. Those are so, yeah. I love hearing these out loud because after spending so much time, you know, with them putting the book together, it's just really great to hear. So um, I created some questions and I think maybe given the Zoom um, way that we're uh, tonight, we'll just kind of go back through the loop and you don't have to, I, I gave the questions to the group beforehand, so you don't have to address them all, but just maybe one or two kinds of things that you, um, want to say about the anthology as a whole. So I asked questions like, what surprised you about the poems? What threads of connection did you see? Um, were there areas of conflict in the conversation? Because in my introduction, I talk about how I kind of put these poems in, the, in little conversations. Um, so were there conflicts that you saw? Um, did you discover voices of, for new voices that were new to you? And then just any other kinds of comments that you want to make about the anthology as a whole. So. Um, Sharon, we can go ahead and start with you again. Now, yes. Success. For a little icon, it sure can cause a lot of problems. So when I you know, the first time I read through the book and um, I listened to some of the poems on the uh, Zoom meetings, I just kind of listened or read the way you eat a Twinkie or something. Mm, this one really tastes good. Uh, this is the delicious cookie, you know. But after Christine uh, suggested this meeting, then I reread and I read with a sharper eye. And the great surprise to me was I had expected a lot of landscape poems so that there's no surprise there, but there is. There are some landscape poems that are praise the beauty of the land like Coles and Sneathans and Picatis and Peacocks, but there are landscape poems that have this shadow among them. And by shadow, I mean kind of a darker side or, um, you know, those uh, uh, collaborative poems that came out of the West River? One, uh, they never, I would really like to give credit to the people who wrote them, but one of those people wrote, stories exist in scars. I thought that is exactly what I mean by the shadowed poems. And from the very first part in this book, I'm just gonna use last names now here. 
Binkley says, the state never felt like it was mine to claim. There's something in back of that. Um, and Mosley writes, these are the landscapes of our lives. And if you read her poem, it's not all pretty picture there. It's not all easy. It's the landscape of our eyes. So I got to reading farther or more broadly. And um, then I ran across these people's poems, Whirlwind Soldiers, um, Rosalinds, Wikas or Wikas, I don't know how it's pronounced, Walkers, Sulis, Yosts, Cook Lins, Williamsons, Lewis, Duffley, Standing Soldiers, Joneses, Wolfs, they all have that ache in back of them. And I thought that was, I wasn't going to, uh, I, I didn't expect that exactly, not so pronounced because when I left Mobridge um, for Minnesota, that devil of a state, um, somebody once said to me, the only thing about you that's interesting, Sharon, is that you're from South Dakota. But when I left uh, to go to school in Minnesota, uh, things were not like they are now. I mean, no gay guy would stand up and write a poem about his life or feelings. And um, no, no Native American, no Lakota, Dakota um, would, would write, would, would be invited or, or acknowledged or anything like that. So I really, really loved running into those poems. But I love the humor in some of the poems too. Steve just read one that's really humorous. And, and well, I'll go on, that's enough for me. But that's what that's the characteristic, that, that slant on the landscape that I never felt or read about or knew about when I was growing up in Mobridge that is now present in poems, in many poems. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, the, collaborative poems so you know it's not good for the editor to put in her own poems in this book it but, but <laughs> there are these collaborative <laughs> poems that I facilitated and, and if you if you look in the bios I put at the very end where those collaborative poems came from so I conducted some workshops for the bad for the main street square project in in Rapid City, two years, 2014 and 2017, with this project. And I asked for, I conducted workshops and then I asked for submissions. And from the submissions about those places, the Badlands and the Black Hills, I quilted together poems. So oh. they're, they're not mine, they're not, any individuals, although some of the individuals who contributed can probably <laughs> find their lines, you know, because I kind of just pulled from the, you know, the, I just pulled from those contributions and I just kind of crafted. And what they were originally were their, their choral poems. So they were performed in many voices. So they are actually performed in three or four voices. And so for the book, I, and they were never, they were never collected anywhere except for they were performed, you know, physically. So I, um, I just kind of altered them for the anthology, and I thought they were appropriate, so I threw them in there. I really liked them, and I liked the geology <laughs> in many of them, and there was some geology in other poems too. I really liked that. <laughs> so uh, that's so. I'm glad you asked about that because I I really hadn't explained that before in any of the launches or anything. I just kind of, they were snuck in there. <laughs> Good work. Thanks. So um, anyone want to follow, any of the panelists want to follow up with what Sharon? I'll, I'll go next. Um, mostly because she says such smart things and I'm thinking if everybody says such smart things and then I have to speak. So I'm preempting that by going second. And also because Christine, I, I've never really, I, I mean, I really am grateful that you preserved those poems, you know, and that you found a home for them. So, 
So thank you. And that's another good example of the kind of project that when Christine Stewart Nuno says she's going to get it done, she gets it done. So thank you. Um, so I can't remember what the question was exactly, but I want to uh, piggyback on what Sharon was saying about finding um, kind of the expected uh, tropes and language about landscaped and then the unexpected. Um, and I sort of had some of the same ideas, but removed from landscape, just to think about the language itself. And so one of the delightful things that I found, um, and I grew up in Western Kansas, so, you know, never have left quite Western Kansas, but one of the things that I found was, um, I was expecting to see a lot of bales, you know, hay bales, uh, fence lines, trees, you know, snow. I had some snow and some weather. So I was sort of expecting all of those things, but I really took delight in the unexpected language. I'm pretty sure mellow yellow is in here somewhere <laughs> in one of the poems. Um, Tinker toys, uh, lazy boys. And so it's really fun for me when I saw the um, juxtapositioning of the expected language and the expected words and then kind of the unexpected things. And I just want, I don't think Lindy Obach is with us, but I just wanted to share a couple of lines from her poems from the book as good examples of this. Um, and I won't, I won't read the whole poems, but she has a poem towards the back of the book called 160. And it's about, um, well, I'll just, I'll just read a few lines. It's called Rowboat by Lindy Obach. When I press my forearm to my nose, I smell softly scorched wood. The smell that comes from the curving over a table saw all day, cleanly slicing fresh two by fours. My German from Russia grandma, who always smelled like merits and Avon lipstick gave me the guts to pull off my own scent. And that's just the first few lines, but I love that she says two by fours, um, merits and Avon lipstick um, and gave me the guts. Later in the poem, she throws in Discovery Channel. So that was delightful to me. And then again, from Lindy Obach, um, and I could pull from so many poems, but these were just two that, yeah. So she's, so this is from a poem called Vermilion, Lindy Obach. The boys at the next pool table over talk loudly about the girl who works at Subway, how the way she says meatball marinara is enough to thin their red American blood and quicken their swollen hearts. These boys are blonde poets and this sandwich artist, their muse. So, you know, there again, I love like meatball marinara and sandwich artist. Um, and so I would just invite you, I guess, as you go back and read the poems again, or, you know, in, in the whole book or individually that you kind of find those uh, new phrases, new uses of language, um, modern things that are still very much a part of our life and our writing here in South Dakota. So thank you. With that, I'll turn it back to Christine. Who wants to follow up of the panelists? John, go ahead, John. I'll go. Um, I appreciate, uh, Darla, you're mentioning um, those Two, two poems by Lindy Obach. Um, I have those marked in my anthology as uh, two poems that I thought were really great. I love the end of the um, rowboat poem. Um, the, that ending is one that I think uh, where the, the poet leaves you with a, an image uh, that has multiple parts to it, the smell and the in the image of her in a cedar canoe she's built herself and um, out there on the river. Um, and uh, I'll go back to something um, Sharon talked about a little bit, the, the geography. I really like seeing that in the, in the poems. There's a lot of that in there. And uh, just, I had this other book that I pulled out 
um, when I was thinking about these poems, it's um, O.W. Kersey's Dakota Literature from 1928. South Dakota was a state for 30 years, uh, 40 years, something like that at that time, 30 years. Um, and a lot of the things are uh, that they address in there, the poems are very different forms, um, but a lot of the things that are in there uh, approach the same subjects, the, um, the landscapes especially. And um, like a lot of these poems in here, the uh, poets uh, approach a, a work that they had. I, I have a tendency to write poems about work. Um, and uh, I appreciate that, uh, the, the kinds of hands-on um, work that people have done and it's the way it ties them to the natural setting that they're, that they're in. And a lot of poems in here do that, um, uh, just sort of memories of uh, that kind of activity. Um, but uh, an, another thing is, I love those poems about just moments in time. Um, things, uh, I think there's a whole section of those that uh, Christine mentions in the introduction. Uh, there were some sort of things, thematic things that, that held that section together. Um, pictures of past life, like after a, the pool. Uh, it's a poem on um, 132 uh, by um, Brandon Johnson. Um, just pictures of, that's the one with mellow yellow in it, uh, <laughs> Darla. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, just those pictures of that uh, simple life that I think is uh, so much a part of people's lives in South Dakota. Here in Madison, we still see little kids riding their bikes to the, the big fancy uh, swimming pool that we have in, the, in town here. Um, so some of that still uh, captures. Another thing that I kind of like in terms of the, um, the way that the poems as a whole approach the geography of the state is that they're not a lot, aside from Steve's uh, um, poem, uh, there's not a lot of cities mentioned. Uh, I think Sioux Falls, Hermosa, Gettys, Vermilion, and Brookings. I have to throw Steve's poem up for my, for my uh, thesis here, but uh, a lot of them are just, they're not associated with the town. So in some ways they're in the South Dakota is, um, it's not city oriented and you can see that in the collection. It's, um, it's rural and, and you really feel that. I had some uh, Chinese friends that, came to the United States and we were walking around Lake Herman State Park one time and, and they really didn't get my interest in trying to find natural settings in China, which in Shanghai is not easy to do. Uh, and when we were walking around the, the lake, she said, now I, I recognize why you look for and you cherish these natural settings. And I love that the poems um, uh, really get at the close connection that people in the state have to those natural settings. Um, and I'll mention one other thing that I thought was sort of interesting is it the poems sort of dispel the, um, the sort of typical sense of what South Dakota is, that it's got Mount Rushmore in it, and there's, I don't think, I didn't remember seeing a poem about the Corn Palace, um, doesn't mention that. Um, so there are some things that a lot of people think is something that defines South Dakota. And in, in a lot of ways, this defines it uh, in, a, in a very different way than how our tourism might, you know, there's not, you know, a raft of poems about snowmobiling or hunting or uh, fishing or um, going to Mount Rushmore. So I I'm, appreciate that. Uh, anyway, I look forward to more conversations. Yeah, you know, I, um, I, 
expected a hunting poem or something like that. And I never, I didn't, I don't think I read, read one, to be honest. Like there, I mean, yeah, there was no treat. Uh, there, there was not a treatment. <laughs> there was not. I don't recall there being one. Are there? Can you think of fishing poems in here? Um. Yeah, there's one about a woman, a female fisherman, or allusions to that. Okay. Um, and yeah. I think there's like some some different allusions to hunt. Like there's there's maybe you no know, one poem devoted to hunting, but there's definitely hunting woven into other poems, feathers flying and things like that. Um, Maybe yeah. poets don't hunt. Maybe that's part <laughs> of it. Good point. Laura Jean, you want to take it take it away? Yeah, I mean I can I can take it from here. Similar um, yeah I mean a, a lot I mean observations like what a lot of the poets are sharing here and similar to, similar to to Sharon's experience, I read it the first time just for pure enjoyment, flipping through, reading. Um, and then um, after becoming a part of this, took a closer eye to the work. And similar to, to Sharon, in some ways saw how um, the abundance of Im imagery that we do have in the collection, because there's definitely a lot of landscape, snow, there's a lot of pink sunsets um, that, you know, cause I was kind of going through with a pen to like look for those similarities across the poems. And, and what I saw was interesting how all of those different pieces kind of come together to form the prairie landscape. Like it is vast, it does stretch out to the horizon and you get pieces of that, that like the collection serves in itself as, as the plains in a way. And yet, just like the plains, what I was, I think, surprised by was both the, um, you know, the, the similar experiences, and yet we can pan down into people's very acute individual personal experiences. You know, like there's several about gardening or farming, but everybody has their own unique story um, about that. So um, I did find that enjoyable. And also the way, Christine, the way you put it together in those pockets and to culminate with the more modern poems, you know, to take it from like kind of almost a history, I thought was enjoyable to read as a collection. Um, and then one thing that I was also reading for was, I mean, you put this well in the introduction also, Christine, was that this is in a way a snapshot of the world as it existed before the pandemic that we're all in right now. And even I would say before a lot of the political divisiveness and a lot of things that we're going through as a nation right now. And again, as, as a bit of a outsider looking in to South Dakota, um, one of the voices that I, it was, I was curious about because Christine, you mentioned in your introduction, some of the voice, some voices are missing altogether and um, like in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and a diversity lens, which is how I, I came to my own work in the collection, White Woman South Dakota, that came from a lot of different like diversity trainings of how we identify ourselves and, and knowing like the privileges or the world that we live in. And so taking a look at, you know, South Dakota's makeup and how some of those other issues from the national stage do or don't get woven into um, the experience of being from South Dakota and like how that is perceived on a national and, and international stage. So John, um, what you were just referring to about how this is, is definitely like atypical of all the like postcards you would get from South Dakota because we can drill down into that experience. But um, how, how is, I guess, what I, what I was also wondering is like, how do South Dakotans think about certain other aspects that affect their daily lives via the news, via, you know, what's happening somewhere else? Like, how does that come back home in a way? So, I mean, I, that's just a place to start because I'm curious to um, hear more about, about some of that. And, and I'll just add, um, because Sharon, 
Sharon mentioned, um, referenced a line that I wrote, like, um, the land is not mine to claim and yet I've been given, does acknowledge some of the weight that, you know, I carried with, you know, not necessarily being beholden to the crimes of our ancestors, but what do we do to help right wrongs and write that out in the collection? Like what, what, what is, what is that? And what do we do now? What do we do with all of that? And like, um, those were some of, some of the things that I was paying attention to as I was reading this. And it, I do have to say like, it was a delightful way to, to travel back home and, um, and have it, have it as kind of a dipping back into certain memories, driving, you know, across the prairie. And there's just a great collection of different um, poems about birds. And my father was a bird watcher while I was growing up. Like we had the North American <laughs> book of birding, you know, in the kitchen and we'd look through the binoculars and just all the birds and, and the big blue sky. Like those are things definitely not to be taken for granted because they're not, they're not everywhere, so. Steve, why don't you, Steve? Hi there. Um, I think one of the strengths of this anthology is what it doesn't seem to try to do, which is to establish some kind of us group identity for South Dakota poetry. It allows for a, a great degree of heterogeneity uh, and it doesn't do what many thematic or geographical anthologies do, which is to try to kind of circle the wagons and say, hey, look, you know, we have literature too. And that's the easy temptation when you're uh, in a, a place where there's not a lot of uh, activity going on is to say, is to kind of take the provincial route and say, hey, we, we've got a, a literature tradition too. And that's all let's all you know, be South Dakota poets as if there's one kind of thing you could be. Uh, this, this very expansive, it's stylistically really expansive. And I think that that is uh, a very good thing uh, because I've, I've been part of anthologies that, that don't do that. They're, they're thematic or they're geographical and they just, they really wanna set a narrow boundary. And those things become really dated really fast and they, they don't have, uh, as much of a record as a snapshot of an era as I believe this one will. So that's, that's all on uh, Christine uh, for, for uh, putting that together and, and doing it that way. So uh, I think that that's uh, a, a nice successful thing about this is just avoiding some of the traps uh, that this kind of anthology could very easily have fallen into people have mentioned the the uh you know the corn palace and all the the, the cliches i think that uh you know we, we're staying away from them and, and there's no seeming effort to try to put south dakota in any kind of box but just hey we're poets this is what we do this is how we witness the experience of being in the place and, and just leave it at that without having to try to define what a South Dakota poet is. Uh, Bruce, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, so I read through the book and I made a few notes. So I'm just kind of reading off my notes. Uh, one thing I want to say right off the bat, probably the one poem that I, uh, well, collaborative poem that uh, I like, well, the, the best I liked out of all this, if I was going to pick out one of the best, and that was the Black Hills uh, and Water poem, a collaborative poem. Uh, I recently am spending time out in the Black Hills and, uh, it, it, a poem is bland and it's very descriptive, but it is, I, as I was reading it, I was going, yeah, yeah, that's, that's why I love the Black Hills, of all those elements in it. Uh, 
it, it, it's, uh, it's great. I think it's probably the best description I have ever read of uh, overall the Black Hills, the flavor of it, the, uh, and, and, it, and it kind of, it's got an emotional flavor to it. So that, that's probably was my favorite. Um, and uh, the other uh, the thing is, uh, as I read this is, I, I'm a firm believer and we have to record uh, well, we have to record our history. We have, we have to record our times. And one way of doing it is, is through uh, poems. And I, I personally think that uh, uh, a good poem should be like a good letter from a friend, a good conversation from a friend. So as I read through that book, it's like all these conversations and you get to know a lot of people. And it's like, wow, yeah, th this is like a sitting down with a good friend and you ask them, well, What's important to you? You know, what, what happened to you today? And they say, well, let me tell you this. And that's what the poem is about. They're telling you what, what they value and what they're thinking, what happened. Um, yes, we, we have to create our own literary culture. I mean, that, that, that's the thing. We have to recognize it we and we create it and we got to, uh, you know, network around. The thing of it is there's more of us out there then perhaps any one of us thinks so. And that's what this book does. It is it's quite a collection of individuals all over the state and telling their stories. Um, so uh, the, the, the closest uh, oh, example I can think of this, and I mentioned this to Christine earlier, is that uh, there's something in Australia, the uh, Aborigines of Australia, they go on these long walkabouts and they seem like they're aimless, but they're not. What they're doing is they're making their world real. That's what they believe. They, they got to go out there and this is, this is how they make this world happen. This world becomes real to them. And this anthology, as I read through it, that's what it occurs to me. It's a walkabout. We are walking about South Dakota. We are making our times real, and we make these stories real. Um, it, I, I think it's great. I, I think it's something we should keep in mind that these are conversations, and by saying them, sharing them with other people, we make them real. What we do with them, where we go from them, that's up to us, you know. But first. We got to walk about and see who our neighbors are. So if I was going to uh, sum it all up, I think uh, the South Dakota poem is one wonderful walk about South Dakota. So back to you, Christine. Okay. Um, thank you, Bruce. Um, Tom, did you, where I kind of lost you in my view. Are you there still? I came back. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh yeah, I can hear you. Can you wrap, can you wrap the panel portion up? Right. Sure. Um, so, Christine, what I really came away with, you know, when I read an anthology, I enjoy the freedom of not, not having to go chapter by chapter and just read wherever I feel like opening. And and getting prepared for this, I forced myself to go uh, page numbers sequentially through it. And then all these kinds of really great arrangements start to reveal them with the way you've placed the poems. And I, I would have totally neglected that otherwise. And so thank you for I guess, kind of forcing me to do that. There's two poems featuring a Plymouth automobile paired next to each other. And I just, wow, look at that, you know? And just that alone is kind of like, what a joy to, to, to find these two Plymouths on opposing pages by opposing poets. Um, I mean, so I really enjoyed that part of it. I, I really like the collaborative poems and everybody's no noticing the landscape. And, and I, I think that's great. I think that's important. And I think, you know, Stephen did this very intentionally with his poem about selves. And then by talking about selves, he talks about Wall, Winter, Robe, Wabe, Hot Springs, Presho, and two other places. Um, you know, it's it's place as self. And 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 that's that's done intentionally and that's really neat. And but that's going on in different ways through the whole book, too. I mean, like in, in Laura's poem, Black Elk says the important things are inside of us, and then she talks about place and strawberries, and soon the strawberries are inside of us. And that same thing kind of blossoms all over again. And I, I, I appreciate especially, especially the way that, that you edited it. 
Thank you. Thanks. That was a, you know, I was trying to figure out how to arrange it. And I know, I knew I didn't, I could do it geographically. I could do it alphabetically. I, I mean, like, there's all like different, like traditional ways, but I felt like um, I could, I could, I could suggest something else by arranging it the, the way I did. And so um, that was a creative, um, I guess, an intellectual creative making for me in that part of it. So I'm glad you say, I'm glad, I'm glad you like that. So a couple of things before we take some questions um, from all of you. Um, and that's if if you want to be, uh, Darla's gonna put a link in the chat. And if you can give us your um, name and email address, then through that form, if you can click on that form and send that to us, then we can make sure that we have um, your, information so we can keep you up to date on uh, with our mailing list if you're interested in South Dakota State Poetry Society events. Uh, I know that we have um, for our members we have a chapbook putting a, a chapbook we're having a chapbook contest coming up soon um, that opens on May on February 15th and so we're going to I'm going to do a work uh, yeah there's John's chapbook I'm going to have a um workshop for members of SDSPS on Saturday on how to put a chapbook together and some, give some tips and stuff like that. So um, you can get a lot of information for poetry making and poetry reading from our group. So please sign up um, or please get information. Please look for us on Facebook, etc. cetera. We're, we're, South Dakota State Poetry Society is a membership um, funded organization. So we depend on our members in order to promote poetry across the state. So, and Ashley says she'll save this link out too. So that, that's great, thank you. So what are some questions that you all have for, for me or for any of the other panelists? <laughs> I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm not a native of South Dakota. I really came from, grew up mostly in Oklahoma and spent the last 25 years in Texas, Northern Texas. And so I don't know what the sauerkraut triangle is. <laughs> and, no. <laughs> sure, and you hit the wrong there button. <laughs> there you go. All right, am I on now? Yes. I seem to have a great problem reading mute and unmute. Um, the sauerkraut triangle is, do um, you know where Eureka is in Harriet and those towns up in that area? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Right across the borders into North Dakota, there are three counties. One of them is Emmons. And there are a lot of Germans from Russia in there. Oh, oh I with Okay with Russia, from Russia. So they, they themselves call themselves the sauerkraut triangle. I see. So I wanted to say about your poem. Uh, so the first time I, I crossed the Missouri and Kansas and so on and many times, but I'd never crossed the Missouri in South Dakota until my uh, a mother-in-law and all of us took a big family trip up here. And we were coming from the east, east to the, the west on our way to the Black Hills. And we, we crossed the Missouri, and so I was still fairly young. I mean, it, you know, in the, in my early 40s, and so we were water ski crazy. And when I saw that great river, I uh, <laughs> I wanted to stop and go water skiing. And I saw some people skiing there, and your poem reminded me of that. It was very nice. Of you. And then I have a question, the gentleman, that, and, and I'm sorry, I don't know his name, that uh, wrote the poem about the nuclear situation. Were you talking about the silo? Was that what you were talking about? I wasn't quite sure. Yep, that, yeah, and if you're ever back in South Dakota, there is a Minuteman uh, Missile uh, National Park Service exhibit where you can take a tour of the original uh, launch setters and, and, and where the missiles were placed and so forth. Yeah, yes, I remember crossing that uh, I think it was what interstate 90 was mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah okay I, I just wanted to uh, and then the uh, young lady that wrote about outsourcing 
I'm a uh, retired IBM executive and I did real outsourcing and, and I never visualized outsourcing as she did. My outsourcing was more along about technical geniuses that were doing things for us from all over the world. And so uh, I, uh, I never visualized someone else seeing outsourcing differently from the way that I, I see it. But uh, thank you very much, everyone. Oh, and I meant to say Steve, who happens to be my neighbor, by the way. Steve, if it were in the latter 60s or early 70s and it were Haight Ashbury and you had a, a bandana on your head and some incense going, I'd say that you were either smoking where, marijuana or taking an LSD trip. I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> it's all natural, man. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I, I didn't mean it in a derogatory manner. I just thought it was a lot of fun to think of that. Thank you very much for allowing me to make comments. James, do you um, hear the difference in the way you pronounce the river and the way I pronounce the river? Missouri and Missouri? Oh, uh, yeah. You, you know, I mean, I, I, I know from uh, folks who are from Missouri want to say that, but I say Missouri simply because when growing up in Oklahoma, you know, you just kind of learn to pronounce it that way, like okay. the state. But okay. yes, and, and I do appreciate your pointing that out, but that's just a, uh, you know, the way I grew up listening to it in, in, in school. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I wanted to add, Christine, that uh, I, I was going. I was going to say this earlier. I forgot, but um, I was just like really impressed. Like I know you did kind of a call out for poetry, so it wasn't necessarily that everyone who submitted these are, you know, professional published poets. But um, the work was really, really good. Like I, I think I went in thinking, like having like one level of expert uh, expectations on the quality of the poetry and yet it, it was it was so so good and um, some of the poets tonight like referenced some different poems I think we all like starred and dog-eared the ones that like really <laughs> jumped out at us but um, I, I was also like really impressed and I was holding up John I was holding up your chat book earlier but um, I loved your work and I saw you had this and I had to get two copies for myself. So I've really enjoyed uh, uh, John Nelson's chat book, um, West River, which was the uh, the poetry winner 2019? Um, it's really great. So you can get this on the site that they link, linked uh, in the chat box too. I highly recommend it. Right, thank you for that shout out. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Um, I, okay. Can I, just kind of jump in here and say something else that I uh, I noticed about these poems. Um, these poems, they're very readable. Uh, there's not uh, a profound difficulty of language. Um, they're South Dakotans, South Dakota poets seem to be pretty plain spoken people. Uh, it, it has a, a figurative language of its own, but um, it, these are very readable. I mean, I, I sometimes think, could my mom appreciate these poems? And uh, I, I think for the most part, yeah, I think she could. So uh, thanks for that. And yeah, thank you, Laura Jean. I have a question for everybody who's a uh, uh, panelist. What are you working on now? And how does South Dakota play into it? Not at all. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I was say I'm I'm working on um, some poems about poison, and um, taking some uh, a reference from the Book of Revelations and um, ancient or medieval text by Catholics about how to memorize. So it's like combining these two texts, and it's poems about poison. So South Dakota, I don't think is, as far as I know, I don't have plans to poison anybody in South Dakota. So, but it's about, uh, yeah, so nothing about South Dakota. <laughs> I'm working on something, but I'm really superstitious about that stuff. I don't like to talk about it until more is on paper because 
if you talk about it, then you get pleasure from talking about it and you lose some of the dynamic, I lose some of the dynamic. But South Dakota does have a foothold, a foot in it, yes? Mm -hmm. um, I am also working, well, I'm working on preparing to enter a master's program in the fall. And um, so I've been reading and writing a lot of poetry. Um, I don't know if there's enough time. I do have a new piece of work that does have South Dakota as a seed. And I'd be happy to read that if there was time, but um, I will look to the leaders to see if that's okay. Um, well, let, I, was, I was hoping we'd have time to do that, but I'm not, I'm not sure we will now. Okay. So maybe this could be the time that we at least go talk about our new, a new project or like with these questions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so um, I guess for me, it's just a lot of like writing, preparing, studying, reading, getting ready to apply to um, some MFA programs. But um, I, I feel like South Dakota always hovers in the background for me. Again, even as somebody that doesn't live in the state and maybe for that reason it's just always so close um in my memories or when I'm going to write um how about you Steve what's the answer to your own question uh well I've, I've got a novel coming out set in South Dakota which I'll, I'll be on this show in a, about a month or so cool uh with Ashley uh but I'm also working on a new set uh, a short story collection I haven't been doing short stories for a while but uh, my first novel was set in uh, Eastern Colorado. Second one set in Eastern South Dakota. And for the collection, I'm just kind of broadening it to include the space in between as well. So uh, just kind of taking a trans Great Plains uh, kind of look, a, a cross section of many uh, different places. So I've got some that are set in Sioux Falls, uh, one uh, in the mountains outside Rapid City, uh, and I go up to Bismarck and down mm -hmm. to Wichita and uh, east into Colorado. So mm -hmm. just trying to expand my territory a little bit. So it's not just South Dakota, but kind of looking at, at the whole Great Plains uh, socio cultural psychic ecosystem, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I would like to probably pitch a new book of mine's coming out uh, this this year. Uh, both came out last year, but uh, decided not to put it out because of uh, COVID. Because uh, it's well, there's been no poetry readings other than on Zoom, yeah. so on and so forth. So anything that was put out this last year probably had uh, uh, a hard go. But anyway, it's it's called Heart of the Prairie. Uh, and I, I continue to write about uh, uh, the people I know in, in ranching life, farming life. Uh, and, and probably the main difference about this is uh, I have kind of an ecological section. Um, the grasslands are disappearing in a hurry. And, uh, you know, a, a change is coming. And I, I, I think it's a change that uh, a lot of people are not completely aware of unless you start going down the back roads in eastern uh, South Dakota. And as I drive west out to the Black Hills, it isn't until I get to the Cheyenne River that you actually run into pretty solid grasslands, you know. So that, that's a lot of it, what I write about. Uh, and um, so it, it's, it's coming out uh, this year. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I, 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 I I don't think I'm done uh, uh, saying about this because uh, I'm trying to give voice maybe to something that needs a little more voice to because there's something we're losing. So that's what I'm working on. Um, John? Yeah, I'll jump in there. Um, I wish I could say with more uh, certainty about what I'm trying to do, but uh, uh, one of the things that is sort of driving me is a way of trying to figure out a way to combine the, um, to marry the, um, the travel poems uh, 
the place is far from South Dakota with my South Dakota poems and and put a collection together that sort of seeks to uh, uh, make sense of the the connection of uh, you know this human being that's sort of bringing a kind of sensibility uh, from South Dakota to these far flung places. Um, and yeah, I just kind of have to figure that out. My wife and I love to travel and I write about that travel. And, uh, but we like staying at home too. And, and I write about uh, you know, South Dakota quite a bit. So there's that. Tom, did you have, are you working on something right now? I'm putting the finishing touches on a nonfiction collection of poems that's called Soviet Missions to Venus. It has absolutely <laughs> nothing to do with South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a new book coming out um, in the summer called The Poet and the Architect. And it is a lot based on South Dakota <laughs> and my sweetheart. Um, the architect. And uh, so I, John, was thinking a lot about how to organize this because there's a lot of South Dakota poems in it, but there's also a lot of um, other kinds of poems in it. So I've got some ideas for you if you want me to, to give you some feedback on the arrangement. That's one of my favorite things to do is to think about how to structure um, collections. So and as you, so it's coming out from Terrapin Books, which is a press in New Jersey in summertime. And it just, um, this is kind of new news, so I don't really have more details on it, on it yet. So just that it, it'll be out in the summer. Um, but uh, also with new collections and new ID, new things, um, South Dakota State Poetry Society is launching PASC Press. Um, so in the month of June, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to open a call for manuscripts uh, by South Dakota or South Dakota affiliated poets who are members of South Dakota State Poetry Society and will be publishing um, single authored collections. Um, it's going, we're going to, we're going to have it. Uh, I'm going to choose and Lee and Ropa is going to be a reader, the first readers, and then we'll send it out for blind peer review um, to, in order to decide um, which will which we would like to select first for publication and, and perhaps an order, but because <laughs> because we're kind of like a pay as you go uh, thing, we're going to publish one book and then we can when we get enough money we'll publish the next book <laughs> and when we can get enough money we'll publish the next one. So uh, you know there could be one book a year. <laughs> um, we'll just see about that. It's an experiment that we're going to try out um, because I love putting, I love editing books, but I'm not going to edit another anthology <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> so um, anyway, just keep a lookout for that. Christine, can you say again when that call opens up? Because right, because soon the chat book call. Right. So right now, sure. it's, yeah. So the chat book call, oh, uh, the chat book contest starts February 15th and I can't remember when it closes but it's, it's May 1st May 1st and then yeah. I and then the um the full length collection like will be in June and it you know it's not going to be an annual contest or it's not really even a contest it's just an open call um for members of South Dakota State Poetry Society and if you're if you write if you're in South Dakota if you're a resident of South Dakota, it doesn't have to be about anything related to South Dakota. But if you're affiliated with South Dakota, <laughs> it does. So I'll be talking about what that means um, in the call when I get it all situated and formed up. So, but and it's it's exciting because uh, because I think I think what I've learned in this anthology. Besides the fact that I love to make books and that's just my thing, making books. I like creating books. I like make writing books. I like designing <laughs> books. I like putting books together. I like. So anyway, besides that, um, I just really learned that there is so much good. There's good, really great writing out. And in the publishing world with poetry, people spend thousands of dollars um, for many, many years trying to get their books published 
um, and they're, they're, it's very competitive. So I think that there's a place for us to focus on building the literary culture here in our state and on building a place for our, ourselves too. So I wanna contribute to that. Thank you, Christine. We greatly benefit from that <laughs> and your leadership and your vision. And again, I'll say it the third time, your ability to get things done and to, and to do what you set out to do, so. Well, you know, I, this is, I, I'm, I appreciate you mentioning earlier um, some of the place, the people like SDSPS that I missed uh, in my opening, because this book really is this the work of many hands. Like I, I had the um, idea, but it really wasn't my original idea. Like I, I borrowed ideas and you know address, you know, adapted them from other writers, other people who had anthologies, um, and then you know with the support of SDSU and you know and. Um, South Dakota Humanities Council and the students who helped me and the board. I mean, there's just, there are so many, so many people who helped put this all together. So it was, it was a lot of work in making sure that every all the balls are spinning or wait, all the plates are spinning or all the balls are in the air. But, um, but at the end, it was, it was, uh, I feel like it's just really well worth it for all the things that you've all said. So just want to make sure everyone knows that I appreciate all the help and support um, it, whether it was time consultation money that I was given to 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 facilitate this into the world I would like to thank you Christine for doing this because uh, when we look backward into South Dakota history there are very few times that uh, uh, there was I think I think you'd have to go back. It's right around 1900, I, if I remember right. There was an anthology of, of writers at that time, uh, of, uh, of poets. Uh, and I think going forward, uh, it's pretty, pretty scarce. So I, I think historically, we, we have an historical document here. And uh, the thing is, because of your call and how widespread it was, I, I think we got such a representative sample. I'm sure we miss people, but it is good. It is good that we've done that because people need voice. That's it. When you have voice and voice is through those, at those poems I read, you have power. You have the ability to start changing your life and the world around you. Writing, poetry is power. So thank you. Well said, Bruce. Yeah. Well, it's about eight thirty, Ashley. What do you what What's your normal time frame? Uh, well, I mean, it's really up to you. I shouldn't say that last week lasted two and a half hours long, so um, we really don't have necessarily a time limit. But maybe we open up to any more questions. From yeah. If there's any? Yeah. Let's one, we'll do one round. One more round of questions, and then we can. We can wrap it up. There are six, 16, 18 questions or comments on the chat. Oh. Are there any uh, questions in that? There uh, are not. Nope, it's just uh, mostly some comments and then uh, some sharing of links. Mm -hmm. um, I, and for those that haven't been following through the chat, I did tell everybody that tomorrow I'll send up a follow-up email to everybody that's registered and include the links to where to purchase the book as long as, uh, along with the registration that you guys were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. Darla was kind enough to send me a bunch of information that I can send along, but I also include a list of all the uh, poets that spoke tonight, as well as any information we have about them, about upcoming books or how you'd be able to contact and get any information from them. So we'll also share all that information up on our social media pages as well. So, but um, you'll receive just one more email for us in regards to tonight's Tune In Tuesday that will carry all that information. And tonight's talk will be up on our YouTube page. So in case you missed it, or you wanna go back and hear the poetry again, um, it'll be up there and by Friday, hopefully. Sometimes it takes a little while to upload, uh, but it'll be up there for you guys to listen to again. I just wanna say a quick thanks to Christine and all of our poets that joined us tonight. Thank you so much. 
for um, for me, it was just starting one of these series because it's cold in South Dakota and I would prefer to not leave my house when it's this bad, um, but would love to have events that I know we're all missing things right now. And so uh, I guess the only, well, one of the only good things about Zoom is being able to still connect during what is this kind of crazy time and be able to hear all these wonderful poems, so. Amen. Thank you. All right. Any last minute questions or comments? Any, anyone? <laughs> Should we uh, talk about the uh, poetry camp we're putting oh, together yeah. this fall? Yeah, why don't you give a little um, information about that? That's awesome. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, my name's Craig Paul. I'm a brand new poet. So um, uh, this is all really, really, really new to me. Um, if you look at the background in my, uh, my screenshot, uh, it's a picture of Badger Clark's uh, cabin. And uh, I'm part of a group that's putting together a poetry camp sponsored by the South Dakota State Poetry Society. Uh, in conjunction with the Festival of Books. So on September 30th, we're going to have a inspiration camp and a workshop on poetry that uh, Christine will be leading us through. And it starts out with a poetry walk at the uh, Badger Clark uh, Badger Hole, and then ends up with our workshop at the Peter Norback uh, Education Center. And so again, it's just trying to give more people inspiration and maybe a little education mm -hmm. on uh, putting words together uh, in some kind of format that we currently call poetry. And uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. There will be more stuff coming out probably in a month or two, but uh, uh, other than saying, look for it in the Festival of Books, uh, program, put September 30th on your calendar, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, I am really excited to be a part of this, and I'm especially excited because Darla and I have been poking Craig for how many years, Darla, to get him to write, and so like, well, he said he, he said, he told us he wrote a little bit, and we're like, share it, we want to see it, share it, share it, and finally, <laughs> Not only has he shared it at open mics, but then you've started to facilitate conversations around poetry and planned this event. So it's it's just really fun for me to see that <laughs> as an outcome of of poking <laughs> poking at you for over the years. <laughs> we get our way eventually. You're a wannabe, yeah. Yeah. wannabe poet. <laughs> Um, I'll extend just to widen the um, the poet community a bit. I extend a, an invitation to all of you if you want to come out to Vermont. Um, <laughs> Robert Frost country out here. It's about uh, two hours from the Frost Place up in Franconia. And in the summers, they do po beautiful poetry readings in a barn that opens up to, um, to the mountains there. Um, so... Road trip yeah. <laughs> when it's safe. <laughs> we, my it's wife and I, yeah, our, not now. <laughs> uh, visited that uh, frost farm up there in Franconia, and I have a poem that uh, I wrote one summer thinking about Robert Frost clearing his driveway <laughs> of snow or trees. Great. John, clearing it of snow or clearing it of trees. No. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, sh uh, shoveling is snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would have had to do that there. <laughs> oh yeah, we got a, a bucket load today. Well, more than a bucket, we got a lot today. Yep. Well, thank you all so much. It was really great seeing all your faces and um, your names for some, <laughs> for some of you who can't see your face. 
and be on the lookout for more events from the Arts Council and more events from SCSPS as we get some programs and contests and chapbooks and book making underway. Thank you, Christine, Thanks. for all the work you do for poetry. You're Thank welcome. you, Christine. Thanks, Thank Christine. You. This was great. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.